Hello students and welcome back to the lore of the Iron Kingdoms with me, Professor Castor. Today we're going to be going over uh, Trollkins as we do and we'll see if we can't uh, get another handful of these guys knocked out today. Uh, the Trollkins we're going to be going over today are Horgle, uh, both his journeyman warlock and his actual warlock status. And then we'll be going over Kol Grimma. And next week we're going to finish it off strong, or next time we read the Trollbloods, we're going to be going over Calandra, uh, King Leto as a warlock, because of course we all know that King Leto has a blood oath with the Trollkin as well, uh, Ragnar, and Skold, and then that will finish up our warlock Trollbloods. But that will be for next week. Today we're just going over the three warlocks, well, technically two warlocks, and... You know, one journeyman war or warlock. So, but before we begin, I thank you guys so much for uh, checking into class. Uh, please like, subscribe, comment. Let me know how we're doing. Let me know if there's anything you would like to for us to discuss in the future. And uh, thank you again, Private Your Press, for letting us read your fantastic lore. And let's begin. Horgol Iron Strike. Horgol Iron Strike is an anomaly among the close knit clans of the United Creels much preferring the fiery solitude of his forge over the company of his fellow Trollkin. A loner in his creel, southeast of the Shard Spires, Horgel is uninterested in the traditional activities of his creel. Instead, he excelled in the ancestral smithing rites passed down to him by his mother, Lagertha, a skilled blacksmith and gifted warlock. He took to this instruction with a will, finding solace in the rhythms of the hammer, anvil, and flame. Horgel learned more than the rudimentary methods necessary to shape weapons and tools. For Lagertha made use of trolls brought from her hereditary lands in the Wormwall Mountains. In addition to commanding these fearsome creatures in the defense of the Creels, she used them in her work, tempering steel with the scorching heat of pyre trolls and etching runes with the searing acid of slags. Horgel learned these techniques, eventually employing them to craft superior weapons and armor. He toiled contentedly at the forge until the ill-fated day a large force of dragonspawn and blighted Nis stormed his Creel's home. He fought alongside Lagertha, who rallied the Creel's defenses and inflicted a heavy toll on the enemies before she was finally struck down. Her tragic death induced Horgel's own sorceress awakening, and he took control of the remaining trolls and launched them at the enemy. Despite his efforts, the Creel was lost and Horgel was forced to retreat with a few other survivors. Feeling no real kinship with these Trollkin and seeing them only as a reminder of his loss, he soon left them behind as well. Horgel drifted south, his heart full of bitterness and hatred, and the only possessions he salvaged from the old life were his mother's smithing hammer and a fiery sword shaped by his own hand. He wandered for some time, surviving by his craft and his weapon, before finding his way to those allied with the United Creels. There, his smithing prowess and promise as a warlock caught the attention of certain Creel leaders. Grissel Bloodsong is one who sees great potential in the young Trollkin. Beyond his innate ability to lead trolls into warfare, she believed Horgel may have an even greater destiny forging weapons of power for the Creels. While he still prefers solitude, his desires to exact vengeance on those who destroyed his former life drives him to fight alongside his kin in battle. His affinity with pyre and slag trolls continues to serve him well, both on and off the battlefield. In combat, he brings the power of fire, hammering foes with the same strength and precision he devotes to shaping metal. There is always a simmering rage within Horgel, and in the heat of battle, his sword and hammer are infused with his inner fury. Well, Horgel the blacksmith, and a magical blacksmith at that, which makes him even more dangerous, because when when uh, warlocks or warcasters start forging their own weapons and inciting it with magic based on animus abilities from you know creatures they work with these weapons can well <laughs> he already pretty much makes them magical in his own right but uh, yeah very uh, dangerous guy very dangerous in fact makes him even more dangerous in this site because he is a journeyman warlock which means you can tag him up alongside other full-blooded warlocks or full, full-fledged full warlocks as well, making him uh, a very useful thing to have in your army. So, But let's read over his Mark III to Mark IV changes and see if there's any, and then we can just go over him in general. All right, let's start with his stats. So he is a speed 5. His magic attack is a 4 because he is a journeyman warcaster. 
Uh, his mat is a 6, so he's pretty decent in melee. Uh, defense of 12, arm 15, so arm has dropped by 1 point. Probably a balance situation there. Uh, he also has tough and immunity to fire, so that's not any different from his original setup. Uh, we have burnt meat as one burnt meat as one of his abilities. War beast in this model's battle group can charge enemy models suffering from the fire continuous effect without being forced, which is kind of terrifying when you're already cooking and the war beasts get real excited about it. Uh, so that's a spooky thing to have his war beast like that, and he requires at least one war beast to run with him. Uh, just because that's how Lesser Warlocks work. Uh, Lesser Warlock, also this model is not a Warlock or Leader model, but has the following Warlock special rules. A battle group controller, fury manipulation, healing, spell casting, and transferring damage. Uh, this model must have at least one War Beast in its battle group at the start of the game. So nothing has changed there. Let's check out his weapons to see if anything has changed there either. Uh, he still has his uh, Flaming Sword. So it is still a mat 6, power 11, and it's magical and causes continuous fire. So if he charges in first, lights somebody on fire, his war beast can run up behind him without having to spend any fury. And then you can just, you know, burn out all that fury to their heart's content. And then he has his smith's hammer. And this hammer is a mat 6, range 1, pow 12. Um, also magic weapon, and it has ram attached to it, so he can start pushing people around with that. When an enemy model is hit by this weapon during the model's combat action, it becomes knocked down and can be pushed one inch directly away from this model. If that model is pushed, this model can immediately advance one inch directly towards it. And since he is a warlock model, he can use his focus to keep making additional attacks. So he can actually catch somebody on fire, knock them down, and then well, keep knocking more people down, so that's always a very useful ability. It makes him even more dangerous. As a solo, he's very, very dangerous. But his spells include Hot Shot, so target model in the Spellcaster's battle group gains boosted range attacks. Or boosted range attack damage rolls, sorry, I missed the end one. And this is an upkeepable spell, so always useful to have you guys. So if you can get at least one guy with a range attack or a spray attack, even better. Uh, they get boosted damage rolls on it, which is a free boost is always a very useful, and the more range attacks you got for that, even better. Uh, it appears that his Ember Spark has been replaced with Immolation. Uh, Ember Spark, that original spell, before it was changed out, gains an additional die on the Spellcaster's attack roll if the target is not suffering the Fire Continuous effect, and then Ember Spark causes fire damage, and on, on a hit, target model suffers Continuous effect. So. That was a cool spell, not really super useful, but they just replaced it with a little bit easier read for the uh, Immolation. So Immolation causes fire damage on a critical hit. Model suffers fire continuous effect. Real simple, easy to use. Uh, maybe not as far of a range, but still very useful to have. And as a solo, this guy is a fantastic, uh, fantastic guy. Real good at hitting people, and he can control his own war, lo or war beast, so... Yeah, and especially if you get him with a ranged war beast or a war beast that has any type of spray, this guy would be even more useful. So keep him always in your back pocket, and the blacksmith's always good to have in general around your army. But let's move on to his full fledged warlock and see what we got there. Horgle the Anvil. The destruction of his creel at the Talons of Everblight's Legion set Horgle Iron Strike on the solitary path filled with fiery conflict across the wilds of Western Amorin. Along the way, he had many opportunities to perfect both his craftsmanship as a smith and his powers as a warlock. Though he remains a loner, uncomfortable among even his own kind, he has found a new sense of purpose in forging weapons and armor for the Creels. Even as he provides his assistance, he strikes to persevere his autonomy, refusing to put down roots and always requiring compensation for his labor. Most who know him who describe Horgle as grim and mercenary, but the Warlock's actions are rooted in what he believes is the best for the Creels. While there is no denying that he has a bleak and pessimistic outlook, that has never prevented him from pitching in to fight for the kin or lending his trolls to face down their foes. Horgle's journey have tended to draw him toward sights of bloodshed and mayhem, more in answer to the fires within him than though any deliberate intent. He reached the Bloodstone Marches to visit the newly established settlement founded in the shadows of Mount Shelleth Breen by the old Thornwood Creels just as they were assailed on all sides by the ravaging Gatormen and Faro. 
Amid this crucible of carnage, Horgel truly came into his own as he put aside all hesitation to stand among the kin in defense of their home. This battle also forced him to re-examine his basic values. It became apparent to the young warlock that the real and tangible apocalypse was taking place all around him, and that only unflinching resolve and the ability to make hard choices would see the Creels endure. In the aftermath, when most of the United Creels departed for new lands, giving up the wilds that were theirs by right, Horgel remained behind to beat back those forces that assailed his people. While he still relishes the opportunity to exact revenge on the minions of Everblight, he is more than willing to unleash his simmering rage against any enemies of the Creels. He has made tentative contact and friendship with several of the greatest lore masters in the United Creels, individuals like Horlock Doomshaper and Ragnar Skysplitter, who have tasked him with the restoring of the great weapons of the Creels. When not laboring at the forge, Horgel fights with sword and hammer to protect the flickering, guttering flame that is the Trolkan race. So the black, the magical blacksmith of the Trolkan has come to his own. He is a full-fledged warlock with his fiery sword and his fiery hammer. I'm not sure if his hammer causes fire, but it looks like something that would cause, uh, cause fire. So let's read his Mark III to Mark IV changes, see how good he is, see what he's best at. Because uh, most warlocks are usually, you know, predispositioned to be either a unit base caster or a well, war beast caster. So, or just a magic caster. I don't know. Sometimes they have all three. But let's see what he's got. And we, of course, are going to start with his stat line. Cause why not? So his speed is five. His magic attack is up to six. Yay. Uh, his mat's now a seven, so he's a little bit more of a melee caster than he was before. Uh, his defense is fourteen. And his arm jumped up to 17, so compared to his journeyman caster, that is a lot better armor. Uh, he has a 6 arc and a 12 control range. He is still tough, and he still has immunity to fire. Of course, that makes sense, because he is technically a blacksmith, so I imagine that makes sense. Uh, his abilities are still... Uh, he still has burnt meat, so that's always fun. War Beast in this model's battle group can charge enemy models. Suffering from the fire continuous effect without being forced because the smell of it just apparently is enticing. And then the second ability he has been given is a field marshal fire resistance. Cohort models in this model gain resistance to fire, so they can't suffer the continuous fire effect. And if they are being damaged by fire, uh, it's one less die on damage per Mark IV. So that's even better. His weapons, well, technically he just has something called forge weapons now. Um, instead of his original two hammer sword strike, he just has a dual weapon. And his abilities on these are a mat 7, range 1, pound 12, both are magical and both cause continuous fire. Um, the chain attack ignition is still the same, so if this model hits the same model with both its initial attacks with this weapon, after resolving the attacks, this model, the model hit the other enemy models within two inches of that model suffer a power 12 fire damage roll and the continuous fire effect. These damage rolls are not considered to be or have been caused by an attack which means you cannot boost them individually so that is a thing but the ability to catch everybody within two inches of the model being hit twice if he's going up against something say large base size or higher that's everybody within two inches of that guy's base so that could be a huge AoE. So that is a fantastic, and even though POW 12 doesn't seem like a lot, he's still throwing fire around and his guys love fire, so you zap him in and you send his war beast in after him, it's gonna be, uh, it's gonna be a delicious barbecue, I imagine. Then we have his feat, of course, it's called Stoking the Flames, that appears to be spelled the same, so we'll see if it's the exact same spell. Friendly faction models gain boosted attack and damage rolls against enemy models in Horgul's control range, suffering the fire continuous effect. So, that is kind of, well, I'm not going to say broken at all, because that's actually kind of epic. So, friendly faction models gain boosted attack and damage rolls against models in his control range. So, uh, that means that his war beast also gain their burnt meat ability on there as well. And so does, or, yeah, so... Everybody just gets to charge for free against those guys, so yeah, that's kind of uh, kind of nice. And then it's every model in his army, which then I imagine his spell list probably also covers some uh, ability to toss fire onto some people. So let's read that real quick. 
So we have, uh, it looks like his consuming flames have been replaced with cleansing fire. Uh, consuming flames, if we still had it, it's a, a, ten, a range 10 AoE 4, uh, POW 12 fire damage rolls, and models hit suffer the fire continuous effect. That's been cleared out. Uh, we replaced it with cleansing fire. Cleansing fire causes fire damage on a critical hit. Model hit suffer fire continuous effect, so it's not automatic anymore, uh, but it is more powerful at a POW 14. And it's an AoE 2, so uh, uh, you're splitting hairs on that particular one. So, but it's a pretty decent fire spell. His second spell, Fire Starter, hasn't changed at all. Uh, target a model in the Spellcaster's battle group. That model's melee and ranged attacks cause continuous fire. So that's automatic continuous fire. It's also upkeepable too, so you can give somebody in your in your uh, battle group the ability to launch fire with his ranged weapons and just catch people on fire automatically. So very, very useful. Um, his other spell, inviolable, inviolable Resolve. Probably spelled that or pronounced that wrong, but that's how I do. Uh, target friendly faction model slash unit gain plus two arm and cannot be knocked down or moved by a push or a slam, which is basically what it did in the previous. So giving them armor is always very useful for the Trollkin because they already have kind of beefy armor anyway. And at tough, you just you know force people to have to do a lot more damage to you before you have to start rolling. So. And then the last one that he has is Solid Ground. While in the Spellcaster's control range, friendly faction models cannot become knocked down or pushed and gain resistance to Blast. And having Blast resistance in this in this uh, new Mark IV is actually incredibly useful um, because a Blast resistance, any kind of Blast damage, they suffer, a, they suffer only one damage die uh, for Blast damage. And, well, that, that's it. That's a, that's a very useful... Very useful thing, especially if you guys, if you have a lot of pigs around that don't have super high armor. So, and not being able to knock down, the game's super tough too, so that makes them even more done up. Uh, I would say this guy just likes to toss fire around on people, so the more guys that you can get to play with fire, uh, the better his feat's going to be in the long run. And he's got two different spells that can cause fire with continuous effect. One's automatic, one has to crit, but and as long as he's swinging on people, so, very frontline caster, and at least he has the uh, defense and armor to make him a little bit more beefy in the front line, and the mat to make up for that, too. So, yeah, get his group up there with everybody else, make them all the front line, keep them going. But, let's move on. Alrighty, in the last warlock we're going to be discussing today in class is Colgrima Stone Truth the Winter Witch. And we don't have all that much information, or at least I don't have all that much information in the archives, because she's relatively new. Uh, she came from the Northkin, so the Northkin are guys that came down with uh, the Keg Slayer and all those particularly icy Trollbloods that have come down from the North to help their United Creole cousins. So let's read what we have in the, the little archives. Thank you to War Machine at University for posting this. Always a useful source for any type of, uh, any type of information for anything Mark III and behind, so... Fantastic. But let's read about Kolgrima Stone Truth, Winter's Witch. Kolgrima Stone Truth is a half mad and mystifying oracle. Born with the gift of sorcery, this Trollkin witch could read the threads of the future in entrails and bones, it glimpses fates in the eddies and whirls of a blizzard, and divine the destinies of people in the patch of frostbite blackening a limb. Kolgrima emerged from a cave serving as her mountain lair. When enemies threaten the north, accompanied by great packs of winter trolls and serving as ancient war leader rather than oracle. So she's very similar to the old witch of Kodor in the aspect that, you know, she lives in a cave and she comes out when she needs to to help, you know, level off things for the Trollkin. So I wonder if she and the old witch know each other. That would be interesting lore. I'm not sure if they've ever met. But let's check out her Mark 3 to Mark 4 changes and see, uh, I'll see if she's gotten better, see if she's gotten worse, or see if this maddened old sorcerer has gotten even more maddened in Mark IV. And as always, let's start with her stat line. She's a speed 5, an attack, or a magic attack 7, so she is more of a more of a spellcaster than the rest. Uh, mat 6, uh, defense 14, arm 15, uh, arc of 7, control range of 14. She has tough, she has pathfinder, and she has immunity to cold or ice. So... That is a uh, that actually makes sense. I believe most of the Northkin, Northkin actually do have the the frost resistance abilities. 
Uh, let's read her abilities, which are a dark power. This model gains an additional die on magic attack and magic damage rolls and discard the lowest dice roll in each roll. So giving herself signs and portents automatically for her spells. Uh, definitely probably going to be a very spellcasty warlock here. Uh, her next one is Owl's Wisdom as a star action. Range 5, target friendly faction model. If the model is in range, enemy upkeep spells and animize on it expire and cannot be and it cannot be targeted by enemy spells for one round. So that's actually kind of nice. You uh, really knock down some other enemy spellcast abilities and making a guy immune after it for one round. Well, that's always going to be a very uh, useful. And that is technically the same. So none of her, none of her, uh, her abilities have changed between that. But if she did come out in the uh, Northkin update, that makes sense since those were relatively uh, newer models. Her, her melee weapon is a knife, which makes sense if she's mostly just a, you know, a spellcaster. Her melee weapon is a mat six range one magic and blessed, so it ignores, it ignores uh, spells that give opponents any kind of defense or armor boost and then on the on the, the knife she has to spell so when this weapon hits a model slash unit upkeep spells and animize on that model immediately expires so she can shut down other players magic real real nice so that is very good to know let's check her her feet see if that changed at all uh, it's called snow blind and doesn't appear anything changed what it does is enemy models currently in Cole Grimma's control range lose and cannot gain Isle of Sight, Flight, or Pathfinder and cannot make range attacks for one round. Additionally, enemy models in Cole Grimma's control range are pushed two inches directly away from Cole Grimma in the order that you choose. So this is a very powerful spell because not only does it turn off Isle of Sight, Flight, and Pathfinder, but it removes their ability to even make a range attack. For one round so they can't just shoot and miss they can't you know shoot and try to hit people with blast damage they can't shoot at all and the ability to push around your opponents regardless of uh, regardless of how big they are well I imagine with gargantuan models they have their own pushing rules but you can push around models two inches directly away in the order that you choose that's actually insanely useful to get people out of melee and get them moved around a little bit more so yeah, so let's check out her spell list and see if anything changed. Most likely not too much has changed because she is a newer caster. That's usually, uh, they usually get a little more balanced out before they get out. Uh, but her spells include Cursed Fate, which is a spell from original. A target model slash unit hit, suffer a minus two defense. When a damage roll resulting from a direct hit fails to exceed the armor of the affected model, that model suffers one damage point anyway. So, so it's basically a, a sniper shot. Well, but it makes a sniper shot. So if it can't exceed your armor, it will. And if you're a, if you're, it's a full unit of, you know, one damage point, you know, military men, it will just remove them off the field in, in turn. So that's always nice. Uh, the next one is freezing mist. This one has changed a little bit, uh, just mostly in the wording and not really anything else. So you place a cloud effect template, which are always three inches AOE, anywhere completely within the spellcaster control range. The template is a hazard that remains in play for one round. While in the template, living enemy models without resistance to cold suffer minus two to their attack rolls. So it's a good uh, defensive buff because the best defense is a great offense. And if you can shut down your opponent's offense, that's a great defense, right? Um, so yeah, no, that's pretty much the same from the other one. And it appears we lost uh, Winter's Tide uh, for a spell that's called Hoarfrost or Harfrost. I'm going to say Hoarfrost. Uh, so the original Winter's Tide. A Winter's Tide deals cold damage and on a critical hit, the model hit becomes stationary unless they have immunity to cold. And then Hoarfrost uh, causes cold damage and on a critical hit, models become stationary unless they have uh, unless they have immunity to cold. The only difference between these two spells is Winter's Tide, it costs two and it was a spray attack uh, and it was a POW 12 so, you know, sprays are always fun. Uh, but this one, Hoarfrost, is a Cost 3, range 8, AoE 2, and PAL 14. So a little bit more damage on the output. And, you know, you can still freeze people on the spot if you, you know, get a critical hit. So that's still a thing. All right. And then we still have Hunter's Mark. So friendly models can charge or make slam power attacks against enemy target model hit by Hunter's Mark without being forced or spending focus. A friendly model charging 
or power attacking, slamming an enemy model that has been hit with Hunter's Mark gains plus two speed while resolving the charge or slam attack. So always a very useful spell. Hasn't changed since the uh, since the Mark III. So it's always good to have uh, and give your give all of your war beasts a nice little uh, boost. And with a Warlock with her power cape abilities, it's always good to give her a couple extra war beasts in her battle group just to help divvy up that fury so always good to have and then her last spell that has not changed is vanish place the spellcaster anywhere within completely within three inches of its current location and vanish can only be cast once per activation um, the exact same as it was before just gives her a little bit more survivability uh, it is a cost one spell so you can get her out of melee and you'll probably want her out of melee too because she's not really a melee combatant she is definitely a spell caster and you want her to be thrown around those spells the best you can uh, and any spell looks like she really only has two offensive spells and only one of them does damage so well technically three with hunter's mark but uh, but uh, yeah as far as targeted offensive spells so yeah so you want to get her in there or well, not get her in there you want to keep her back and just kind of you know, control the field, get your guys where they need to be, you know, push around the enemies to get them out of the way, stop your enemies from, you know, making ranged attacks. And that, what's nice about her her feet here is it's very uh, first or second turn type of, type of feet. Well, I would say more second turn because most of the first turns usually always running. But uh, very, very much a second turn feat because being able to close down ranged attacks and Isle of Sight and Flight and Pathfinder very early on in the game really does make a difference in later games. So, yeah, Cole Grimma, very dangerous lady, very much kind of reminds me of the old Witch of Kodor, but uh, yeah, much colder than the old Witch of Kodor probably. Uh, but that's all we got today. So thank you guys so much for listening. If you're still here, uh, please like, subscribe, comment. Let me know if you're enjoying our Trollkin, our Trollbloods uh run you know if you have any cool stories about the troll bloods and such um uh next week uh, or next time we talk about this we're going to finish up all the troll blood warlocks and then we can get into all of the war beasts of the troll bloods which giant trolls are always very exciting to talk about well these guys are still pretty big compared to the average human but yeah you know how it is uh thank you again private your press for letting us read your fantastic lore uh and as always class dismissed